Thanks for doing that, Ben. See everybody in the room, some monthly friends that show up at these calls. Good morning, everyone. Welcome. See Good everyone morning. in the room, getting situated in the room. Sorry, we're just a minute or two late here, but we welcome all you and um, Good morning. Yeah, I see Letitia just welcomed everyone. You can say hi in the chat box. Tell us who's here. Um, and I'm Debbie Nelson. I'll tell you who's here for me. I'm Debbie Nelson with Together SC. And I am welcoming all of you to this Wednesday morning conversation. We call it Coffee and Conversation. And this is a, a session that's really been designed over the last several months for our business partners at Together SC. And while I know that some of the folks that have registered for day are not business partners, we welcome you. I know there's some nonprofit leaders that are also on the call. Typically, these monthly coffee and conversations are for our business partners to get to know each other better so that they can support our nonprofit leaders even better than we, they do now. But we, um, our calls are open and we welcome you today. I think by the very nature of the topic and who our presenters are. I think that enticed a lot of you nonprofit leaders to join us and I know we're going to enjoy learning about uh, the Southern Equity Collective and, and I will introduce them in the moment, in just a moment. Um, before I do that, one of the things that we discussed last month, we did a lot about marketing and communications at our last business partner gathering. And at that time we were hosted by Jessica Monday and Catherine Harvey and Catherine plays an important role for Together SC in that she is our strategic communications partner and she is looking for content. <laughs> she wants to help represent our business partners the best that we can. And so I want Catherine to do a little shout out about um, what would be helpful for you and for Together SC. So Catherine, welcome this morning. And um, if you could let people know what you're trying to do. Absolutely. Uh, last month, uh... Uh, New South and TRIO got together to talk about how uh, Together SC could better serve business partners by creating visibility and highlighting the work that partners um, do every day, but also do in collaboration with our uh, TSC members. So what we're looking for are just opportunities to kind of um, sing your praises. If you have a collaborative project with another TEC, uh, TSC member, if you have something coming up um, next month that we can shout out, whether it's a program or a workshop, or if we can just talk about in general um, what you do and the services you offer to the nonprofit community, that's really what we're looking for. And that can come in many different forms. Um, we have some folks making like a 30 second video to share with us. You can share photos. You can actually share a case study of your work if you've got something that links out already. Um, it's pretty wide open, but the, during the month of April, we're using our social media platforms through Together SC to highlight business partners all month long. So we're just asking folks who are interested in taking advantage of that to send us something that we can use to highlight the work that you do in this community. I am putting a link in the chat box. This is a, a roundup of our last call. And um, it will provide suggestions for the type of contents we need. Uh, there's also a TSC uh, partner badge online that you can add to your website or you can just shout out on social as being part of the Together SC community. So we'll make sure everybody has that from the business partner standpoint. And we're putting these resources on the TSC business partner Facebook page weekly. Um, so you can check there as well. Um, I, you can reach out to me directly with any questions and I'm more than happy to help you curate some content um, for a post about your organization. Thank you, Catherine. And, and what a great way to amplify your message as a consultant or as a business partner during April. I mean, we have a tremendous uh, mail list that we do our every other week for good connections. We have, you know, broad base of support through our social media platforms as well. So I encourage each of you to do that. So today um, we are gathered here to hear from some friends um, at the Southern Equity Collective. And I, I think both of their names are probably familiar to many of the business partners and to many of our nonprofit leaders, but Hugh Frazier and Caroline Malden are here uh, to share, I guess, a a lot of information that I'm interested in knowing more about what their collective does and how they work with organizations, businesses, and nonprofits across the Southeast. 
um, interesting um, organization that they will share a lot about. I mean, I, I think one of the, the, the coolest things in this time and space that we're in right now is they are a majority black owned um, consultancy and have partners throughout the Southeast. So while they are near and dear to South Carolina, they are doing this work far and wide in the region. And as we know, our region can very much benefit from what they are gonna to bring to us today. So with that very brief introduction, I know you'll, their words will speak louder when they start telling us about their organization. I'm gonna turn it over to Q, who's gonna start, right Q? Yes, yes, absolutely. And we love your colors today, you are vibrant. <laughs> <laughs> I'm feeling vibrant, yeah. I am. And that's a good thing because you know the world we live in, if you count that as joy. Thank you so much, Debbie, for that warm introduction. We will definitely need to add you to the collective on the marketing side. I, <laughs> you were very kind. Uh, and I appreciate everyone here that got up early this morning uh, to join me and my colleague, Caroline. I am Quinita Q. Frazier. I'm a native of South Carolina from the Gullah Geechee uh, Islands. And I am joined by my wonderful uh, colleague, Caroline Malden. I serve as the Chief Growth Officer, along with Caroline, who serves as our CEO. We have two additional founders who are not here with us today, uh, Jonas Chartow and uh, Caroline, Caroline Randall Williams. Uh, we are hoping today we've designed a thought-provoking but very interactive uh, conversation today. So we hope that everyone's had their coffee and also ready to share and learn. So to get started, obviously, we would love to learn more about each of you. So what we're going to do, and I love doing this because I love meeting new people, we're going to call on each of you and ask you to do a very brief introduction, just your name, your company and its mission, because we can all read the name of your company, but I'm very curious about what your company does. Uh, and then finally, just tell us, you know, how you're feeling this morning in one word. And uh, I'm going to begin with Debbie Rice, just because she is in the front. Ah, see, Debbie's also feeling vibrant. Good morning, Debbie. Good morning, Q. It's great to see you and everyone again. I just returned from PTO and I'm still on mountain time. So, uh, I'm a little foggy, still having some coffee for sure. Um, I work for Wells Fargo. I serve as the philanthropic specialist and I serve uh, Western North Carolina and all of South Carolina and Tennessee. Um, that's part of the uh, wealth management division of our bank and I work with clients who are charitable and helping them figure out how they're strategically going to be philanthropic in their communities. In a previous life, I was a fundraiser for healthcare so I've been a board member for many organizations. So I've been on both sides of the table, which makes me unique in how I serve my clients. And awesome. life is good. Life is good. <laughs> thank you, Debbie. And also thank you for sharing that PTO joy. I'm gonna have some of that next week. <laughs> <laughs> thank you so much. Good to meet you. Sarah Massey, good morning. Morning, everyone. Uh, I'm Sarah. I, uh, I have my own little company, SinMass, in Charleston, South Carolina. Um, I um, am a recovering nonprofit chief executive officer uh, <laughs> from uh, 11 years in New Orleans and uh, uh, am working now to just provide CEO level type uh, bandwidth for organizations who need someone to come in and help them with some type of a project um, that might be grant proposal writing, uh, converting your donor management system. Most excitedly, though, um, there is a new venture capital fund getting started here in Charleston that is going to be investing in uh, black and women owned businesses. And so I'm getting I'm helping to crosswalk the philanthropic community and the investment community over into that um, for the purpose of helping to build wealth, not just uh, sign the back of the paycheck, but the front of the paycheck. So right on, excited Sarah. to be doing that. So looking forward to hearing about your work today. Absolutely. And thank you for mentioning that. That's a wonderful resource. Uh, and not only a resource, a, a wonderful mission of that fund. Yeah. Uh, Mark Pitt Pittman, my brother, you're right next to Sarah on my screen. Thank you so much, Q. Uh, my name is Mark Pittman. I run the Concord Leadership Group, which helps recovering uh, executive directors and existing executive directors and wannabe executive directors grow in leadership. Leadership is really hard, and um, I get the privilege of walking beside executive directors and fundraisers to teach them how to how to share life and how to be fully human instead of just being worked to a uh, ground to a pulp. So, awesome. um, and I happen to be 
the proud author of my new book, Baby, The Surprising Gift of Doubt, which comes out on uh, March 23rd. So wow. we're in the pre-order no, stages. Up, Mark, that sounds amazing. It hit the top 100 in its category and it's not even for sale yet. It's like really fun. Yeah. Good job. I'm happy to hear that. And I Thanks do you. want a copy. <laughs> I can do that. Yes. Good morning. Kaki Grant, you're next. I see you there on the screen. Good morning. Good morning. I um, I live in Charleston, South Carolina, and I work with Grant Philanthropic Advisors. I founded it about 18 months ago. I'm an independent advisor helping donors, similar to what Debbie described, um, have helping donors get really clear on their values and then how to align their philanthropic engagement accordingly. Awesome. Thank you for joining, Kathy. Thank you. Melissa Ladd, good morning. Good morning. We haven't met yet. Good to see you. I'm happy to be here. So I'm um, with ISSA Facilitation, and we make strategic planning and decision-making conversations at nonprofits efficient and effective and use visual tools to make sure everyone participates and is heard. So bringing groups to consensus and achieving outcomes um, in a way that is fun and memorable and focused and has a sense of humor and some energy to it. So that's that's really our our um, our niche in um, group facilitation work. So ha- excuse me, happy to be here. Good to meet you. Good to meet you, Melissa. Melissa. And Elmira Raven. This is Elmira Raven. Elmira, yeah. good to that's meet you. That's quite all right. Um, and I am actually a retired ED after 28 years of um, my sister's house, the Shelter for Battered Women and Children. But, um, you know, I also have a consulting business, Get It Right with Raven LLC, where I work with nonprofits to help them develop uh, functioning, active boards, and just to be able to help that board move forward and help them. But I'm actually here as a board member of ECHO, East Cooper Community Outreach, and Increasing Hope Financial Center. So I'm happy to be here. They're doing excellent work as well. Good to meet you this morning. Um, and we have Cleo Brown, who I know very well from Liberty Hill Church, Baptist Church in uh, Charleston. Oh, good morning, everyone. I'm Cleo Brown, and I actually live in Goose Creek, but uh, I think she knew Quinitra, uh knew me from when I was running Roy- the uh, foundation for Royal Baptist Church, Royal. the Royal Foundation. Yeah. So I... Re- I was uh, leadership there for about five years, but right now I am uh, just doing some work with my company. It's called History Matters Institute, and I write and speak about race, class, and voting, and all of my work is dedicated to increasing understanding, introspection, and change. And uh, as it. the other speaker said, I also have a book, Raceology. Raceology. Uh, Raceology 101. After you've spoken on race a long time, you kind of figure out, oh, we have the same issues over and over and over again. So each, each essay is on a different topic that I've discovered is a stumbling block toward uh, getting together closer. And uh, oh, also good. has a study and a discussion guide to go with it. That's so good. that's that's my focus, just Thank bringing so understanding uh, through writing and working on a documentary now. And so, and on in my other life, I run my family's nonprofit where we give scholarships to rural children in poverty. Huh. Thank you for that. That's awesome. The Cleo, you're busy, ma'am. Thank you for sharing. You're busy. Thank you for making time to join the story this morning. And I'm very interested in the book. And Mark has put a link in the in the chat. Beth DeSantis, good morning. Good morning. How are you? I'm wonderful. Thank you for joining. So I'm Beth DeSantis. Um, I am the CEO of Fact Forward, where we work on advancing reproductive health care for Um, young adults and adolescents um, through comprehensive sex ed and excellent medical services in the communities. Um, I love my job um, and I love what we do, but I do have to give a shout out to Caroline because I have not seen you in forever. And then look, we have the same shirt on. (laughs) I love it. 
It was, yeah. I do, I do have to say, ESP. Caroline and I would always run into each other in an airport randomly after we met each other for the first time. Um, I miss seeing you and I miss traveling. I Good to see you. All right. Good to see you. <laughs> That's serendipity. And what I'm going to do for the sake of time, for the people that I know are here, but they have their, their, their cameras off, I'm just going to read their names and y'all know who they are for the most part. Okay, Letitia just turns her, turned hers on. She's on the hook. But we Quinn just turned hers on. She's back on the hook. Woo! You all have Love already it. met Catherine. Charlton Burns is here. Julie Husky is here. Katie Reams is here. Dottie Hodges is here. And someone, 952091, who I'd love to meet, sounds like a double a 007 movie, is also here. <laughs> Letitia, do you mind uh, quickly telling us your name, organization, and their mission? And same to you, Quinn. I saw you girls too late now. And Julie. <laughs> Trying to be here and be anonymous is not is impossible with Q. So good morning, everybody. My name is Letitia Vaughn, and I hold multiple roles uh, within the community. The first is I'm the Chief Operating Officer of Tri-County Cradle to Career Collaborative, where we're focused on uh, the collective impact, bringing people together to think about systems level uh, changes and barriers uh, to increasing outcomes for, for education. Uh, the second role I play within the community is I'm a partner in a management consulting firm, E3, which specializes in helping educational and nonprofit organizations who service black and brown children specifically uh, understand where they stand on the issues of race, equity, and inclusion and think about how uh, that impacts individual outcomes. And then thirdly, I am part of the Southern Equity Collective. So super excited to be here supporting Caroline and Quinita uh, this morning. Awesome. I'm still here. I don't know what happened to my... Oh, <laughs> Y'all, something happened. Oh, here we go. Wait a minute. Sorry, y'all, just a slight... What the heck happened? <laughs> Sorry, I can see. Okay, now I'm back. Sorry about that, y'all. Thank you, Letitia. Good to meet you. Somehow my computer just had a little fumble. And we know that we have a uh, Quinn is here. Quinn, good morning. Good morning, my friend. It's so nice to be among such giants. I don't feel like I, I need to take up space in this room. Oh, I'm in the wrong yeah. room, but I love the Southern Equity Collective. So I was curious about what you guys were talking about this morning. So thank you for having me. I actually work for Harvest Hope Food Bank. I'm in development. So we really transform the lives of individuals by providing um, food to the hungry, of course, addressing food insecurities and really trying to aim to have a healthy and hopeful hunger-free world. So that is my role, but that's one hat that I wear. I literally work seven days a week. I also do some work for the Obama Foundation for my brother and sister's keeper. I do women's empowerment, young entrepreneurs work as well. So we have a leadership camp every year to help kids who are inspired to have their own businesses as young as five, all the way to 22. So um, I have my hands in a little bit of everything and I do a lot of work in serving for the North Columbia Youth Empowerment Initiative. Um, many of you might know the work that Serve and Connect does under that umbrella with Cassie and serving uh, communities in 29203. And when I'm not doing that, I'm a poet who writes often um, and I'm working on a coloring book with those who are from marginalized communities, um, coloring book for kids um, from 29203 to help empower them um, as oh, well to cool. live out outside the confines of their environment. So it's an honor to be among all of you Thank giants. You. Wow. Thank you for joining. No, we really appreciate it. And Caroline, I know you're ready to go. So let's go for it. Love it. Good, everyone. <laughs> So good morning, everyone, and thank you for that. It's so, so awesome to be in your virtual company this morning. I am pasting um, a link to our slide deck today. It's very simple, but just so you have that, if you want to follow along instead of following on the screen, feel free. Also, it'll come in handy when we go into our small groups. Um, we, this morning, uh, we've already done our welcome. Thanks to all of you uh, with lots of great energy. Um, we are going to give you an overview of who uh, we are, who the Southern Equity Collective is. I will say, you'll notice that our acronym is SEQ and not SEC. SEC was taken by some other <laughs> entities <laughs> uh, familiar to many of us in the South. Um, so SEQ, we love to say that it's both um, Southern Equity, but also Southern in Emotional Intelligence. Uh, <laughs> you know, so, um, so we'll tell you a little bit about our origin and our approach. 
Um, and then we're going to head into small groups um, and we'll probably spend about 30 minutes, we hope, um, in, in discussion with one another about some of the topics that Q and I will be raising today. And then we'll come back together um, to talk about our small group discussions and um, share some prompts to help us stimulate our thinking as we move back out into the world after our meeting today. So Q, I'm going to hand it over to you to talk about our yes, meeting agreement. I will, and uh, I'm going to talk. Our what, what, should we do it? Let's let's do the agreements first. You want to do the agreements first? Yeah, Could sure. You? Great. Yeah, just to get set. I'm oh, sorry. There you go. Can y'all? Can everybody see this? Yeah, we okay? can see it now. Yep. Okay. Got great. It. So we want to. I want to review our agreements quickly before we talk about us. And these are some just agreements that we, whenever we uh, share with uh, not only clients but some of our colleagues, and and these are these are things that we as a group today, if we agree to, we'll have uh, we'll be able to go as deep uh, as, as as we would like to go, and also have a shared understanding. Number one, we want to remember who we're doing this work for. Number two, participate by actively listening and actively sharing. And when you hear something that's different than your lived experience, ask yourself why you've never heard that story before and make a commitment to learn more. Embrace and explore your frustration. It means you're learning something new mm -hmm. and avoid minimizing or dismissing others' experiences. And my favorite is intent does not trump impact. And so for SEQ, the inspiration and founding of our company, y'all, was really guided by a shared professional mission to challenge the gaps and opportunity um, for racial equity. And uh, Caroline, when she pulled us together, uh, the four of us together to explore founding SEQ, each of us individually identified with this opportunity to institutionalize equity uh, and access throughout companies and organizations. We said around the South, but you all will see we were working with companies around the world. We're each committed to creating the space for real work with long-term positive effects. Um, and we only work with clients who have that same commitment. So I'd like to share with you some of, of SEC, SEQ's company values because for us, it's our baseline and it is our true North. Uh, we recognize the historic and ongoing suppression of black, brown and indigenous people in the United States. And we challenge those gaps uh, with a persistent focus on dismantling systemic racism through individual and collective efforts. Now, the, the, uh, the first, I'm sorry, I jumped into the first, the first of our values is equity. Now for us, equity is not just our name, it's not just in our name, it really, really is our true North and baseline. We, we do, we recognize the suppression of black, brown, indigenous people. And for us, it really, really provides an opportunity for us to focus on dismantling the system, but then also uh, through our collective and, and individual efforts to be able to challenge those gaps. The second is inclusion. Inclusion really, really for us, it ensures belongingness with excellence in all that we do. And we honor and prioritize the importance of these different perspectives and intersectional identities. We're multiracial. Every project we work on will have at least one white person and one uh, person of color on the team. And given the nature of the work and unique role played by white colleagues and those from historically marginalized communities, this is non-negotiable for us. Growth, we recognize that we're all learning and so we expect ourselves and our clients to maintain a sense of, a, of, of possibility and growth mindset. Flexibility and accountability. We all lead very full, demanding lives. You heard everything Letitia's doing, you heard everything we're doing. Uh, but for us, uh, we really, really, really focus on um, being flexible and being, uh, and we make amends so that we were able to not only live a life that's, uh, remarkable for our clients, but one that brings balance to us. Excellent. Can I jump Obviously, in real quick? Huh? Can I just jump? I just want to highlight one thing you said real quick before you move on, if that's all right. Sure, please. Um, I just, I, I think that, um, I think this piece about growth is so important um, yeah. to what we're doing. And I think sort of also um, circles back to our um, to our meeting agreements that we like to share with folks. And obviously we didn't have time today. Normally in a, in a session, we would really workshop those and make sure that everyone does feel on board with those meeting agreements so that they are true agreements. Yes. Today we wanted to share them as an example. Um, but this, the growth piece of our company is both, it is super pertinent to who we are as a company internally um, in terms, because we are multiracial, recognizing that we are all on our own anti-racist journey um, that we as colleagues can hold a mirror to one another and grow through that reflection back to one another. 
Um, but also this idea that anybody that we're working with also needs to be willing to sort of take that feedback and growth. Um, so I just wanted to sort of underscore that value in particular um, before we move on. <laughs> oh, Carol, and please go ahead. Go ahead. If you don't mind, you can yeah. go into our, yeah. Yeah. Well, and, and you'll see on this slide that we also have sort of, we considered ourselves strategists, catalysts, and communicators. Um, and I think I'll just say, share a couple of words on why we've chosen those kind of identities. Um, strategists, we are, you'll hear a little bit more about this um, in terms of our approach, but we believe that anti-racism obviously starts with education and unlearning, um, but it is not gonna be sustainable in terms of systemic or individual change unless we figure out how to integrate it into our strategy operations and narrative. So that's why we really focus on sort of what is the strategy that is gonna carry this work into the world and also help you um, deliver on your mission, whether you're a company or a nonprofit. Um, as catalysts, I love this because, you know, our engagements range so far from um, one month to nine months. Um, it could be even longer because we really see ourselves as thought partners with whomever we're working with. Having said that, we are actually catalysts for work that will be done long after we, our yes. engagement is over, right? Yes. These questions that we raise with each of our clients and with each other are the work of a lifetime. Um, and so our hope is that we're sort of, we're building the muscle within a company or an organization for them to continue asking these questions of one another um, and to continue growing on their anti-racist journey. And then lastly, you'll hear a little bit more about this in our approach, but communicators, y'all, we believe that anti-racism and the work around it it lives and dies based on our ability to communicate with one another. <laughs> yeah. um, and, and, you know, I'm biased. My background is in communications. Um, I know Catherine Harvey will agree with me here, but, you know, it's not just about what we want to say to one another, but how we're going to hear one another and, and choosing our words so that they resonate even with people who are not interested in listening to us, uh, which is often the case when we're doing anti-racist work. So Q, pardon, pardon me for jumping in. I just got very excited No, it's about great. That. No, in fact, no, you, you, out, you actually walked us right into what we need to be around uh, our approach. So thank you yeah. for doing that. No, it's yeah. Good. So we, um, as Q mentioned, you know, when the four of us came together, we all had this deep personal commitment, recognize the opportunity in institutionalizing equity and access. Um, we also brought together incredible folks like uh, Letitia. We're so glad to have on this call today. Um, we have collective members from all across the Southeast. We're actually working on adding some folks from the global South because we're increasingly doing work with international human rights organizations that have staff all around the world. Um, but as a result of that group of people coming together, we are really sort of fine tuning our the Southern Equity Collective's approach to anti-racist work. And we wanted to share four of those kind of pillars today. Um, recognizing again, growth mindset, we're always changing, always learning. <laughs> um, so the first thing is around power dynamics. And, and we believe that this is really critical, um, both in terms of what's happening within an organization, how power is wielded informally and formally. But interestingly, y'all, how we design our own teams as a company. So Q mentioned we are um, explicitly multiracial. Every team, every project we work on has at least one person of color and one white person. Uh, that is both because diversity in and of itself is important, great perspectives, richer conversation. It is also because of power dynamics. We know that in the anti-racist work, white people can do some things easier than people of color can. And also we, white people uh, have been relying on our friends and colleagues of color to do the work of anti-racism uh, for way too long. And there are things that, that I am able to do as a white woman of privilege from South Carolina. Um, I'm able to get into rooms and have conversations with people that um, may be able to hear me in a different way than they might be able to hear Quinita. Um, and we've seen that in action. So Q, yeah. do you wanna share? Yep, yes, we have. Yeah. I mean, we, we've worked with, um, a, well, one board in particular, uh, a, a state uh, organization. And um, for us, between Caroline and I, uh, we both obviously negotiated the need for the organization to integrate uh, racial equity as a part of their board governance structure. And um, to some extent, 
my, both of us serve in equal roles. We've served in equal roles with the organization. And as consultants, we both were presented as equal partners, but we knew uh, entering the conversation that there would be some levity um, to Caroline's perspective. And um, we've seen that before. And I don't, she and Caroline knows, I don't like talking about some of these because um, they're real and, and they're painful sometimes. But uh, what we know for sure is the power that we found that we were able to create across that board is something that will outlive both of us. And um, mm -hmm. it will allow the organization to grow in a way that um, not only the employees, but their, their shareholders will, will be able to feel the, um, the dynamic of, of true, true power, power mm -hmm. and quality. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Um, the second, the second part of our approach that we wanted to share is that we, um, we again, I was saying anti-racism starts with education and unlearning. Um, but in order to carry it on in a sustainable way, it really has to be multi-dimensional and multi-directional. And so, all of our engagements we design to make sure that people um, from the executive level on down are are fully supported in their individual and their collective sort of path, right? I mean, one thing that I would say that sort of encapsulates our overall SEQ approach is that um, institutional transformation starts with personal transformation. Um, and so we really like to support organizations with, with sort of almost, I mean, you might think of it as wraparound services. I'm using that in a different context. Yes. I know so, so many of us are social impact folks, but um, for example, we, uh, we provide workshop design and facilitation um, however, many of you I'm sure have been in sort of racism 101 courses or retreats or what have you. It's heavy stuff, right? For anyone who is coming to this work. And yep. what we don't wanna happen is that we walk away from that workshop and leave people spinning, right? We wanna make sure that we're helping them ask the questions that they need to sort through in order to actually integrate this behavior change into their daily, into their daily work. And in more, and Caroline, that. I just want, Caroline, I wanted to add to that and that um, one of our clients in particular is a, is a national workforce development organization and they created a, a you know, a, a DEIJ council. And when we asked them, we said, hey, okay, so who's on the council? Mostly C-suite, mostly managers. And so for us, it's important that when we do the workshops that we're speaking, obviously to the management, to the leadership team, but it's also important that through the use of affinity groups, we give us, we create a space for employees to be able to, first of all, realize their personal awareness, but then also think about how that ties back to their work and then integrate that into the, you know, the work dynamics that really unifies black and, I mean, uh, uh, black and brown and non-black and brown employees. Um, so, you know, our, the way in which we, uh, we commit to our work includes, you know, this leadership coaching also, so that for the lead, for leadership that, that are responsible for, you know, designing the message uh, for the organization, that they have a, a safe space that they also can reflect upon and then also build their, their competency. And Caroline, that's perfect segue for communication. <laughs> yeah, sure. So again, biased here since I started my career in communications, but um, I, I, I've found this to be just ever more meaningful in our anti-racist work with clients. So I, you know, I think that when we think about how power is wielded in an organization, either informally or formally, it's often like who's making the decision and who has the information to make that decision or influence that decision. And that comes down on a tact in a tactical sense to how we communicate with one another, um, who the communicators are, um, who feels empowered to do that. So I think um, we have found that not only is it important, is it an important, important source of analysis, it also, y'all, is how we heal. Um, so several of our clients that we work with have brought us in because they are experiencing um, pretty intense trauma within their organization. Um, a lot have been uh, triggered by what happened, the sort of racial awakening, reckoning, whatever we want to call it, after George Floyd was murdered last summer. Um, individuals feel pain. You know, each of us carry our own traumas related to uh, race in some fashion. And so we found that designing very intentional processes where we rebuild trust through communication has been really, really critical. Absolutely. And lastly, just to um, share with you all before we open this up for questions, because I know we have, uh, we're sharing a lot of um, big ideas. 
Um, wanted to share a word about our equity framework. So one of the services that we provide to clients is an, uh, a formal equity assessment. Um, each of those assessments is designed for that client based on their size of the size of the organization, the type of organization, et cetera. Um, but what we did in bringing collective members together who have deep experience in doing equity assessments across the board is we kind of designed our own SEQ approach um, to how we think about equity. Um, and so let me just move to our next slide. So we believe that an equity assessment is really measuring how equity manifests itself in an organization. And the way that we look at that is through three different buckets, diversity, inclusion, and justice. Um, I will just uh, note, you'll pro you probably will not hear Q&I or our partners saying very often DEI because we think that, that actually that's sort of, there's some apples and oranges um, <laughs> in that particular <laughs> acronym. Uh, we understand it's, it's you know, the most popular within this field, so we use it um, in order to sort of build bridges, but we really see the manifestation of equity as uh, measured with diversity, inclusion, and justice. Diversity being the presence of people from uh, di diverse backgrounds. Inclusion being the sense of belongingness, and we and we look at inclusion on a spectrum. So it goes from a sense of physical and psychological safety to an ability to be actually effective in your job and to feeling like you have agency uh, in your in your environment. Um, and and it kind of goes to this point that I know many of you are familiar with that the presence of diversity does not, in and of itself, guarantee equity, uh, nor does it guarantee a feeling of belongingness. And then lastly, on justice, um, we believe that justice is the allocation or reallocation of resources to correct for uh, inequities, right? So if we are identifying that there is a lack of diversity or a lack of inclusion in an organization, we also wanna know that that organization has processes in place to both be aware of those inequities in an ongoing way, but also a process to correct for them, right? So to change their policies right. and enact different actions um, to make themselves a more equitable place. Q, what did I miss? No, you didn't miss a thing. I, you know, I, I just wanted to underscore our emphasis on justice, the reallocation and allocation of resources as a end goal, as an outcome of our work. Mm -hmm. Oh, sorry. Yeah. So let's pause there. Um, and I'm gonna take us off of screen share so we can see your faces. If anybody <laughs> wants to ask any questions before we head into breakout rooms. Or reflections or knee-jerk reactions. Yes, Any of the definitions or concepts that we presented, um, we have about 10 minutes a week. It's 9-11. Yeah, we've got about 10 minutes uh, in between, right, Debbie, before we go to breakout rooms and have enough time to have a conversation. Yeah. I have a question. Uh, yes, Sarah. Um, so I, I have the benefit of being able to participate in a lot of these different conversations. So I'm, mm -hmm. I feel very fortunate about that. What's interesting is that there are sometimes even, there's a lot of disagreement sometimes mm -hmm. about these definitions and how you go about the work. And I'm just curious, how do you all kind of deal with that? You know, I, I sit in a position of just absorbing and trying to um, find what, what I feel like I personally need, but sometimes like I, I had to ask someone one time when I was writing a grant proposal, do you want me to refer to black and brown people as black and brown people? Or do you want me to refer to them as people of color? Because people have mm -hmm. very strong feelings yeah. about it. I'm yeah. just curious, mm -hmm. about how, do you, how do you navigate your way through that? That's a great question. I, I think, so um, I'll answer first for internal to our organization and maybe second to how we deal with it with clients. Um, Internally, again, I sound like a broken record, but it comes back to this growth mindset, um, being extremely open and transparent with one another as we are navigating these big questions. Um, so, you know, Quinita and I have known each other for six or seven years now. Um, part of our, frankly, non-professional friendship is that she and I have been very honest with one another. Um, and she has helped me grow as a person and as, as, a, as an ally in this work. Um, and I have to be really willing to sort of set my white fragility aside um, because I, again, I don't have all the answers, right? I am, I am navigating this just like everybody else is. So I think um, avoiding the idea of absolutes um, in this work is really, really important. 
The second thing I'll say within our client work, it goes to this sort of multidimensional piece that I mentioned, um, which is that we get a lot of really important work done in our leadership coaching. So when there is a disagreement within the client environment, um, whether it's some, from something that we said or something that, um, that pre-existed our engagement, we're able to sort of isolate um, and navigate those disagreements through one-on-one -on -one communication, I think in a much better way. Uh, so I'll leave it there. Q, do you have anything to add? Yeah. Yeah, we, we've got a hand up by, <clears throat> by uh, oh, great. Tuttle, but I wanted to also speak to that, Sarah, um, talking about definitions. We've had a, a nuclear atomic bomb released during a meeting about definitions. So this, mm. is, this, is, this is a real question for us. And the way that we dealt with that at the time was to reframe, first of all, the purpose in, 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 in introducing those definitions was to create mm -hmm. a shared value, right? That's why we do it. So what I would say is to respond to your question is we're seeking for an organization or a group of people as a priority to agree to come together and create a shared definition for themselves. We introduce our concepts based on our lived experience and from what our, from our research. But you know that definition, Sarah, you know, it's, it's something we have to own ourselves. And that's what mm -hmm. Caroline was really uh, mm -hmm. describing about our relationship. We own it. And yes. I, I saw that uh, Ms. Hutto from uh, Columbia had raised her hand. Um, and I, I just wanted to apologize for not being able to show myself, but I actually had some technical uh, issues and I wanted not to miss this meeting. So please forgive me. I think Debbie and uh, Quinn and some of the others know that I'm usually not hiding behind the camera. Uh, but uh, our organization just wanted to introduce myself and say that I was glad to be here. Our organization has been around since the mid 60s and we've been having some of these types of conversations um, for a, quite a long time. And it's just ironic that we find ourselves back here again, almost start, like we're starting over. Right. Um, but uh, one of the reasons why I felt like it was important to be here is because you know it's a new day. The conversation is, is still needing to be had, but it is a new day. And we're having to uh, kind of re-engage um, right. and, and bring in the younger voices and, yes. and the evolving voices. Uh, and we do it, uh, primarily by trying to include uh, as many of those diverse voices as possible. So I just wanted to say that and say thank you for allowing me to be here today. Thank you, thank mm. you, I appreciate yeah, it. Lovely to hear your voice. And uh, I'd like to just go back and, and thank you, Caroline and Q for that. I think for those of us that are on the call who are business partners, it's kind of important for us to recognize that we need to take the time to understand where our client is, especially for those of us who aren't specifically doing the DEI work, but we are a participant so that we are both looking for weakness and helping to advocate for it and connecting to resources like you guys, mm -hmm. um, but also recognizing that, you know, sometimes if, if we use one set of definitions or language that doesn't mm -hmm. resonate Right. Uh, with the client, we've got to just kind of use that as another uh, learning tool and, and time to recognize that there's there aren't absolutes. So. Absolutely. And Sarah, I would just say also that um, part of it is, again, going back to this point, which sometimes feels like a cop out, but really is true that everybody is on a, in a different place on their journey. And so right. often the disagreement comes from that sort of lack of alignment. And that's why we actually spend a significant amount of time with clients to establish shared definitions yep. that work for them. Uh, because we're not going to take something off a shelf. I mean, we're not going to, we're not going to moderate our sense of what equity and justice are, but we're also going to create language that feels, one of our colleagues says, uh, we establish a shared consensual reality yeah. within that environment. Um, and that's really important again, because we're looking, we're not looking at, at doing a flashbang anti-racism workshop. We're looking at how do we integrate this in the long run for your organization. Yeah, and that, that, that's what um, I was Kathy, and I just, Caroline. You just real quick, Kaki, yeah, yeah, oh, good, yeah. You got her. <laughs> okay, yeah, so Kaki, um, uh, so we are really fortunate. So, so far our clients have come to us through word of mouth. We're really grateful for that. And a lot of them by coming to us are raising their hand, so to speak, to right. say we are open, right? We recognize we have a problem here um, and we need help. Um, so we have not, I don't, you correct me if I'm wrong, we haven't had, a, had to work with a lot of folks yet who are not 
open to learning. However, I will add to that. We've had yeah. individuals within organizations that said they were ready, yes. Kathy. That's, and that's, that's more what I was referencing. Yes. And I see it on the nonprofit side, because that's where I spent the first oh, yeah. 20 years of my life and, and have served on boards and and now in the work that I'm doing with donors, you know, you're you're looking at a multi generational family yeah. and lots of voices that are influencing um, how philanthropy is directed. And you know, I'm painting in broad brushstrokes, but often the younger generations are more uh, they're further along in their yeah. learning, and you get some eye rolls sometimes. Um, yeah. You know, yes. and I've seen it on boards, nonprofit boards too. So I, I guess I, I meet frustration in these discussions when um, maybe a majority around the table are really willing to lean in and learn and discuss. And then you yeah. have a small minority that is pushing back and eye rolling and think it's a political politicized topic. Yeah, yeah, and, yeah. yeah. Um, so I'm curious what, how y'all would advise us Mm -hmm. um, and, and helping to move that along without forcing it. Right. Right. Yeah. I'll say two quick things and then cue over to you. I mean, one is pre-work. So before we yeah. bring a big group together, getting a sense of where people are, um, and it's usually a couple of questions on a Google form yeah. and maybe also some very approachable videos, right? We recognize that people don't have a lot of time for this. They're not going to go out and read you were Max Kendi from, from cover to cover <laughs> as much as we would love them to. Um, so pre-work helps us get a sense of how, like where we can push, right? And, and, and where and how we wanna navigate the power dynamics within that room. Um, the second thing is again, this sort of individual coaching. So as soon as we identify that there is a, a person or an, a group of individuals who are struggling from our perspective to sort of join the consensus, then our preference would be have, to have one-off conversations with those individuals so that we can really help understand where they are and then meet them in that place. Yeah, and Kathy, I have a perfect, a perfect example. We're, one of, we're really proud of our client, uh, the Georgia Foundation for Public Education. And one of the exercises we did, first of all, we, the eye rolling, everything you're saying is absolutely the truth. And I know you know the experience. It's, it's sort of dismissive because you're like, well, hell, I'm sitting here we're, you know, we're here to talk about this subject and, you know, I, I need you to be connected. And what we, and, and with the, in the example of the, the foundation, uh, we did a cool exercise where we literally asked everyone at the table to just tell us like, you know, how are you coming to this conversation, right? And, and one of, I'm not going to spill the beans on one of the questions we have today, but Kaki, you'll see that we, we, we asked these self-evaluating questions that really and I talk about push, we sort of nudge the person into an openness. Now, whether that person moves from zero to one during a meeting for us is a win. We want people to go from zero to a hundred, right? But zero to one, and, and I'm saying this as a black consultant, a person who is responsible for making sure someone, the needle moves a little. Sometimes it takes more than one meeting. And sometimes mm -hmm. it really is the, the group fake that pulls that person right into that shared collective value. And for us, Kaki, sometimes it's worth it, girl. We can just get, <laughs> get that established. Uh, Caroline, we've got Julie Hussey. Okay, great. Hi, Julie. I was just gonna say that um, I really appreciate your agreements in the beginning, because I think, and, and that focus on communication, because I think those agreements might be the place where we can, where people, I bet you find that people can start. Like, if we mm -hmm. could just agree with this, then we can figure out how to move there. I think that's such a first thing. And that my agreement might just, you know, might be that what you're, what you care about is a priority and then let that kind of decide the decisions from there. And I think the other thing about the communication so important, I was listening to um, Ruby sales and she was talking about her um, dislike of the word inclusion because it implies an inclusion with something else that's there. Uh -huh. It's a little bit like the idea of, remote work replies implies that there's something that's remote from versus distributed work which is all wow. over the place so i, I love mm -hmm. that, that that's i mean that was something i heard just earlier this week and i've it's kind of been a theme that's popping up and i'm like oh am i ready to push back on dei it's like oh god can't push back on that that's so <laughs> that's so in there but it 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 is fun when you play, start to, I don't want to say play with this, but start to really dive into it. So many interesting conversations can happen. I, I yeah. love what you're doing. I, I think when it's turns it, when it's less like a something, a punishment and more like uh, an opportunity yes. to open conversation, right. 
it can be really yeah. fun to think why what words do we it is right right you said it right awesome. it's like play-doh i just want to say that uh, julie it is like it literally is like play-doh that's what we're doing <laughs> love it and I, I will you know one of the other great things that we found i think we originally when we started this company kind of thought we were going to be working with um, mostly white-led nonprofit organizations yep. in the South. Um, our first ever client was the Tourism Bureau, Bureau for the city of New Orleans. <laughs> uh, we are now working with um, two venture-backed software companies, one in Silicon Valley, one in Boston. We're working with an international human rights organization. We're working with a Fortune 200 company based in Minneapolis. So what we've found is that um, it really doesn't matter what kind of organization you are, okay, what right. field you're in, what part of the country you're in. Um, people are really hungry for tools uh, to be able to do this work in a sustainable way. Right. Uh, and one uh, last thing I'll say, and then we're gonna jump into breakout rooms um, so that we can get a little bit deeper into this is that we really see our work as being about the business of building empathy as a skill. Be, and that, and you know, a lot, a lot of times we'll get questions from clients. So are you only focused on race? Can you talk about gender right. equity or, um, you know, religious backgrounds or, um, you know, sexual orientation? And, and our feeling is, yes, we start from a place of race because that's our lived experience. However, once you understand that empathy is a skill to be deployed in the workplace, that creates an intersectional sort of approach yeah. Um, to how we treat one another. So um, that's what I will say about that. Um, okay, we are going to go into bre breakout rooms. Yes. We um, had hoped to have 30 minutes. We'll probably scale that back a little bit, but you guys yeah. will get prompts from us on timing. Um, you have the slide deck link in the chat, so make sure you have that open because that has the prompts in it on the next slide. Um, please nominate a group lead. Uh, you guys have all done this before. Um, so uh, who, that person is just going to help us sort of self-facilitate and then we'll also report out when we come back together um, and watch for messages that will come up on your uh, on your screen. We are throwing a lot of questions at you. We're definitely not going to have time <laughs> to get into all of these. So feel free to pick and choose whatever resonates most with um, your, your group. Um, first, is your organization doing anti-racist work? I think, you know, one of the things that Q raised often when we were sort of first getting started is how are people going to continue wanting to talk about this even after the protests are over, right? right? And and what I think for me as a white person, I see that as my role is like, yes, we have to continue the conversation. And it's on me as a white person to do it, not just when um, Black Lives Matter is is encouraging right. me to, right? <laughs> so I'm curious if you're, we're curious, is your organization doing this work even, you know, almost a year afterwards? Um, we talked a little bit about which of the values that, that we raised resonate with you. I'm curious if you all have other takes on them or if there are other values that anchor your approach. Um, and then this question of going back to the idea that organizational or institutional or societal change and transformation starts with individual transformation. How has that shown up for you um, in your personal examination of your work? And then lastly, getting right to the heart of the matter, what makes this work challenging uh, for you in particular, recognizing you're speaking from your own lived experience. So any questions? I'm thinking we'll do 20 minutes in small yeah. groups. That'll be good. Carol, you mind re uh, repasting the uh, link for the- uh... Yeah, absolutely. I will yeah. do that right now. Yeah, I um, see it in the uh, chat box, but yeah, if you wanna populate it again. Yeah, in case anybody's I think our goal is to have about four people in a group. Yep. Right? And it would be, um, what, about 20 minutes? It looks like we're yeah. at 8, 30, yep. so 20 minutes. Ben, Great. So, so Ben's doing that in the background. I know a few people have had to jump off. I'm just, um, Ben, so you're I'm aware of that, but <laughs> for organizing it. Yeah, give me one second. Let me let me do a little shuffle um, because folks are leaving, and uh, that always makes breakout rooms a little, <laughs> yeah, a little difficult. Yeah, difficult to manage. So give me one second. Um, I think we might end up having five to a room. Just right. um, good. Sounds to good. balance things here. Okay, here we go. Bye, everybody. Bye. <clears throat> You know, I just, hold on.
Looks like everyone's coming back. Yep. Is everyone here? Yep. Who's going to kick off? Is it um, Caroline or? Well, we have Elmira actually led that led our group, so I'd like. <laughs> oh, <to run>. okay. <laughs> so we're going to pass the torch. Okay. Um, so um, this is uh, Elmira Raven, and I um, <laughs> was Valentola as our group leader. Um, we covered the first question, um, how are we doing with the anti-racism work within our respective organization? Um, some groups said, you know, they're working uh, actively and diligently on it. It is moving forward. Um, it's very complex and it's more fluid. Uh, some groups are resisting, kicking and screaming even addressing um, the issue. And um, I'm just gonna say Wells Fargo as a corporation has been actively working toward um, policies and plans and really looking at this issue. Um, the second question, what values resonate um, with um, each individual, um, the growth mindset, stuck in a lot of people's mind, uh, respect. Uh, one individual shared that, you know, she's really trying to work within her own family to help them to look at this issue. And of course have some real concerns about um, changing the mindset after um, our presidential four years and all of the things that have been going on doing at that time, as well as those individuals that are trying to work with the face community that's very resistant to even looking at this issue. And the third question, which is the only last one we got to, which was a real difficult question, we thought, um, how do we connect our personal, I think I got this question right, Mm -hmm. behavior of belief with the organization's behavior of belief. And um, you know, I I think most people felt like everybody is in their own place at their own time and what they know, they know and what they don't know, they don't know. And so to try to keep our personal feelings and belief in check as we are working with people and don't impose that on other people, but um, to respect where people are, um, value younger people who have a more progressive mindset and just continue to um, try to move forward and recognize that there are some words such as um, inclusion that people may be resisting because inclusion means that you were outside and weren't included from the beginning and to just kind of think about some of the terminology we may be using. And I think that sums up our group discussion. Awesome. And I think Katie, you um, are gonna report out for the other group. Yeah, so the first part, um, everybody on the call, their organization was involved um, in some form of, of this work. Um, it was kind of varying across the board. Um, some people had been, been involved in it for a couple of years, then a couple of months, and then some were um, like 50, 60 years um, since, since the initial kind of protest in the 60s. Um, so that was really interesting to hear such a long historical kind of perspective there. Um, and it seemed, everyone was seemed you know, to think that it was going relatively positively, um, certainly sometimes some frustration with um, maybe uh, people doing it in action, um, but but not really wanting to kind of implement it in their own lives and, and move past their initial um, thoughts. And a protectiveness got brought up, and I thought that was a good word to describe that, that people are often very concerned with protecting um, their own uh, status quo. So that was a Great, great term. Um, and then which the values um, resonated. Um, growth also came up a lot in this group uh, specifically and then inclusion. Um, and so it seemed uh, kind of maybe group wide that the, the focus seemed to be on um, increasing the capacity, increasing individuals capacity and then also organizations capacity to process and, and move forward um, in the work. 
Um, and then uh, connection between personal examination and inner work. Um, a lot of focus on in our group kind of talking about how do we implement what's happening with us personally into um, the decisions that we make um, within our organization. And then how do we take our lived experiences, particularly within our own family makeup um, and dynamics as those change and shift because um, we're in 2021 um, and they just don't look the same. Um, and how do we how do we work to implement that into our own conversations, um, especially as we live into those new relationships and things that, that change our perspective. And that's as far as we got was to question three. Awesome. Awesome. Well, gosh, I know I, I certainly hope that I wish that we had about yes. um, three hours more. <laughs> no, we, hour. <laughs> we posed um, we posed some big questions for y'all. Thank you for receiving them with such openness um, and energy. It has been really wonderful to meet all of you today. Um, we have one of our co-founders is um, a PhD in adult learning, and he's been really wonderful to work with because he helps us understand how we as adults uh, can still do behavior change. Um, and uh, one of the things that he often likes to have us end with are these three questions um, for how what you've absorbed in the last 90 minutes has shifted your thinking and what it's sort of stimulated in you um, to, to sort of pursue, right? And, and one of our agreements in the beginning is, is was if there's something that makes you un uncomfortable make a commitment to learn more. Um, so we wanted to offer that to you all. I'm gonna paste a uh, another link in the chat if I can find this proper screen. <laughs> um, and if you would, if you're comfortable, we would love to know your answers to these three questions. Um, and, and, you know, we've thrown a lot at you. You don't have to answer them right away, but I think it would, you know, be wonderful for us to know you know, how your, how what you've heard today may or may not have shifted um, your thinking on this topic. Um, we also in uh, the deck that you have a link to have our emails, um, Q and CPM at southernequitycollective.com. Uh, um, and Q, do you have any parting words for us to? Yeah, just for everyone to find joy in everything that you do. Thank you for your time. And uh, we're all at work, so stay healthy. <sighs> Yeah, I, I want to thank the two of you as well. Um, this has been a great, great time together. Thank you, Caroline and Q. What a great way to, to start our Thursday. What did, no, it's Wednesday, right? <laughs> to start our Wednesday. Um, seems uh -huh. like Wednesday, but thank you. And one of the things that I take away from this, and I love when you said that really um, what you're doing and your hopes and dreams are is building empathy as a skill. Like mm -hmm. I wrote that down because it really resonated with me because we all know how important empathy is, but to yes. think that that's really the outcome of everything that you're doing. And I, mm -hmm. I love that and we'll carry that with me for sure. So for thank you, thank you, thank you. And I bring thanks from Madeline McGee, who was not on the call today, but she said, make sure you tell Q and Caroline. I'm, <laughs> I'm there in oh, spirit. Good. So she's, yeah, she sent no, Thank you for inviting us as well. Thank yeah. you so much. So, yeah. and, and for thank next you. week, yeah, well, thank you for that. And well, next month we will be back together. Patrick Jinks, um, another one of our business partners will be conducting the session um, next month. <laughs> Between now and then I invite all of you, we have a series that we're doing right now with the Post and Courier and uh, next Tuesday at 9 a.m. is our next um, session in that series, which will be about um, honing your message and helping um, strategize with our media partners on, on how to do that. So I hope many of you will sign up for that. But again, have a great day. Uh, love being with you this morning and thanks for everyone sharing their joys with us and mm. look forward to seeing all of you at the next call. Thank you so much, Debbie. Thanks, Ben. Good to see everyone. Thanks, bye. 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 Thanks everyone. Thanks, Cleo.